do a question and answer with Norma Miller. I would love it if you don't be afraid of the hard questions. We have Norma here. I think if we ask her politely, she might speak her mind. And <laughs> we can get a sense of the amazing things that she's seen in her life. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Question and answers with Norma Miller. Do we have a first question? Sure. sure. <laughs> yes. I love hearing about the interactions that Norma has had with sure. many other famous uh, people of color uh, uh, when she came back from uh, after the war. People of color, you mean black people? I mean black people uh, and uh, athletes. Uh, and I love hearing those stories. I wonder if you'd share some of those. Sharing some of your favorite stories of, of the black entertainers and athletes and such that you've well, had a chance to... Why isn't this damn phone on? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite, of course, the love of my life, was the great Sammy Davis Jr. Wow. I adored him. And uh, I knew him ever since he was three years old. I watched him grow up. I watched him become the greatest entertainer ever on stage. And I saw the development of, of a personality that came from no training. He was never educated. All of his training was on stage. And he was the personal performer. I've lived 90 years. I have never, um, even till today, ever saw a performer like Sammy Davis Jr. So he's always been my favorite. And he stole my drummer from me because I had a great drummer. And he wanted the drummer to play with him so he could give him a job. So he took Michael, which was the greatest drummer, and the two of them. And I always said to, Frank, to Sammy, I said, we have something in common. You stole my drummer. <laughs> because he was, he was such a dear person. He was so wonderful. And to see him, he, he, he filled you when you saw him entertain. You ever saw an entertainer that you were engrossed with? Yeah. He, when he first introduced Bojangles at Caesar's Palace, you know, Caesar's Palace is this enormous, this enormous stage, and in the center is this little guy, and he introduced us all to Bojangles. It was one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. He was so brilliant, and he made all that up himself from the song. And that's what Sammy, you ever see the pose when he's like this? The famous one. That was Caesar's Palace. And that was the great Sammy Davis Jr. It was my favorite. My favorite band leader, of course, was Duke Ellington. Because Duke was head and shoulders above most musicians. He was like, uh, no one you've ever been. You, when you were in his presence, you was in the presence of a king. You know, and you had to be very careful what you said to him because he just felt he was not a jazz musician. You couldn't associate him with a jazz musician. As opposed to Pops, which is Louis Armstrong, he always was associated with jazz. And it was amazing how they were all great. They were all different. And, uh, I, and I worked with all of them. So I had an opportunity to observe them. And of course, my favorite, you know, was Count Basie. I loved Count Basie because he was so normal. <laughs> <laughs> and could, he had the greatest rhythm se section surround him. You know, he was just a piano player. But he had um, Joe Jones. The bass player was Walter Page. And the guitar player was Freddie Green. And the four of them together just gave you the music that came, that, the music that all of you listen to today, that's where it came from, the great rhythm section of the Count Basie. Uh, how, how often did you, uh, how often did the dancers get to hang out and talk and be around? We never hung out, no. Uh, in those, we didn't, we didn't do, we didn't hang out. Things, things was different. Dancers was over here, musicians was over here. We segregated ourselves. We just, we were not people that hung out. We worked all the time. We did four shows a day. You do not feel like hanging out after <laughs> You don't. 
I mean, I don't know a time when I finish the fourth show. I had to go, I had to go home if I could drag myself home. You know what, starting at 12 o'clock and ending at 12 o'clock, you work all day and then you stay, you're backstage all the time. And that was why Ella wanted us, that's why we worked with Ella so long because she was the one girl with an orchestra and she was lonely. So she always kept us with her because she can have people her own, her own age. Because when you got to be in the theater all day long, who are you going to talk to? And that was why we were always with Ella Fitzgerald. Well, uh, what, was, uh, what was Ella like? Uh, well, she was a teenager just like the rest of us. She was glad to be working, but she didn't want to be working with just all day long. And it, listen, the life of a girl in show business was not an easy one in those days. It was, uh, first thing, you couldn't go nowhere. Uh, you couldn't go to, a, you can't go to a bar. You couldn't just, just casually go somewhere. So you was confined, especially if you were a woman. And if you were black, you dare not go into hotels enough. So you stayed where you were. You had to find your own entertainment. So the life of an entertainer in those days was very rough. Uh, you, you mentioned you couldn't go into a bar. Why, why was it that you couldn't go into a bar? Well, you couldn't. You couldn't. The first thing, you remember, we came along in the 30s and the 40s, which was a rigid, segregated America. I mean, rigid. You were stopped in a bar, a period. So you just didn't go in. You never, you never tested it. It was many years later, somebody tested it, and that's how the door was open. But up until then, you just didn't do it. So you were always confined. You sit in the dressing room, you read a book, or you play cards. Ella loved to play cards, so we played cards all day long. <laughs> we played hearts. Yeah, that's how the game of hearts. And, you know, that was our game. So we were, we were lonely, but we had each other. Well, we didn't go anywhere. We had no entertainment. We had, when the show hit, you're ready. Another question? Okay. You mentioned that you couldn't stay at hotels when you were touring. Can you talk about where you did stay and what that was like? Well, when we traveled, we began staying at places. Uh, now, you notice around, there's a place, there they was the Phyllis Wheatley House. The, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, all the... Uh, Frederick Douglass House, uh, fr um, uh, the other one that's going to be on a $20 bill, uh, Harriet Tubman. Tubman House. You stayed at, it was what you would call bed and breakfasts today. Uh, you would go in and you were allowed to stay there, but you, hotels was, we never could, you know, hotels was off the room, you couldn't play in a hotel. So that was how I got my, that's how I learned black history by reading the placards in the, in, in the houses I stayed in. And I stayed in a house called Phyllis Wheatley. And that's how I got the story of Phyllis Wheatley because I read it on a card and she was the first black poet of America. I learned that by reading it, by staying in the Phyllis Wheatley house because these, this was the places you stayed when you traveled because girls had no, we had no place to go. So Ethel Waters used to take us to these different houses and that's where we stayed. Because uh, there was no place for us at all. It was very uncomfortable, but we loved it because it was adventure. <laughs> we were going out, we were getting away from home, which was horrible. So one thing pleased the other. And uh, that's how I learned black history, by traveling and reading. I read about Frederick Douglass on a, on a place card. And, uh, uh, you found out that he was a slave, and the, uh, he said the last time they beat him was when he turned around and, and beat Simon Legree. And that's how he never got beat again, and, and I learned that from reading about him. Did you know the story of Frederick Douglass? I know, uh, I know a little bit about it. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> he was the first one to dare to educate black people. He dared. He started a school in the jungle because it was against the law to read and write. So he started a, a jungle where he would bring the people in and he would give them a lesson and that was how education started for black people. Amazing, isn't it? We couldn't even, wasn't allowed to, we wasn't allowed to think. He said, don't think. He said, well, can I, you don't mind if I think, but you couldn't think, you know. 
See, black people at that time was in a bind. You could, I mean, you couldn't go nowhere. So that was the way it was when I was a teenager, but it didn't matter to us because we didn't give a damn. We was out of the house. <laughs> it was simple as that, you know? And I look back now and I said, damn, you know, I didn't know we had segregation in America to Dick Gregory was the one got on NBC and told us we were segregated. We never knew it till Dick Gregory told us. And was that because of Harlem? No, Dick Gregory was the first person that dared to say things on stage that all of us was thinking, but he was the first one that had the nerve to say it. And that was how I met Dick Gregory, through Red Fox. See? He was the mentor for all comedians at that time, because he dared. But see, it was a, a, a thing that happened in Harlem. We had this big riot, and NBC and all the cameras came to Harlem, and they were interviewing the various people that was around, so they'd just talk to anybody. Then the camera got on Dick Gregory. Now, he was the first one to say, hell, we got more segregation in New York City than I ever had in Alabama. I didn't know that till he told me. And that was Dick Gregory, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. And I met him through Red Fox. I met him backstage at the Apollo Theater. And this was the guy that doors was open. Now Red Fox and then these guys have been on the Chitlin circuit all their lives. He was the first one that got beyond the Chitlin circuit. Now he's opening the door for Red Fox. Because remember, Prior to this, all comedians was in blackface. Red Fox and Spotey Odie and guys like this was the first one to refuse to put on blackface. Now the comedians was with their, with their own face talking to people because comedians never talk to you this way. They always talk to you this way. You weren't allowed to talk this way. So they were the first one to have the mask off now they could talk this way, and that was with Red Fox in there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Pygmy was the biggest blackface star we had at the time. And Pygmy never was out, was never without blackface. Even backstage, he was always with blackface. Now the time has come to take off the blackface. He was afraid to take it off. And we were all there when he took off the blackface and he took the cock off. He was the same color as the blackface, I mean, what, why did he even, <laughs> he was black. <laughs> These were revelations that we got backstage, but Pigmeat was the same color as he took off. And you say, well, why did he ever put on blackface? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that was Pigmeat, the great Pigmeat Markham. You know, you always see Sammy Doohead come to judge. On, you ever seen Sammy do on on a laughing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was, but Sammy was just sensational. But that's typical because Pigmeat was the judge. Oh. Pigmeat was the judge, so he was doing. Here comes the judge, and uh, uh, all of a sudden now, here comes the judge becomes very popular. So they booked Pigmeat and the Pigmeat crew into Las Vegas with, to open for Sammy Davis Jr. Who could have thought what would happen that day? They come to Vegas. Now, you're bringing a kind of com comedy into Las Vegas that ha they had never seen before. So now, uh, Sammy is introducing Pygmy because he wants to pay homage to the man that gave him this opportunity to be the judge. Well, it was a dismal failure. It was just so awful. So now nobody knows how to tell anybody anything. So Jack Schlatter said to Sammy, we have to tell Pigmy, he has to cut his routine. So uh, who should tell him? So Sammy said, Let, give me the opportunity. Let me go backstage and tell Pigmy he has to change his routine. Well, now Pigmy has been an artist who has been doing the same routine for 25 years. You know, these are, these are performers that have never had a book or nothing. All they know is how they did something. So how do you tell a person who's been doing something over 20 years he had to change? Well, 
You just, there's no words for that. So Sammy went back to tell him and they waited for Sammy to come back. And when Sammy came back, he said, Pigby said, he can't cut. <laughs> he didn't know how to cut his routine. <laughs> That's something so simple was the reason we didn't move into Vegas and it was a failure for the one, the top comic in Harlem did not make it into the next level. To see that happens is always a, it's, a, it's just something that hurts very badly because Pygmy represented so much of us, but he was, it was times that, it was looking at times was changing. And black faith, comedy, raw, was out. Now we got the guy standing on stage by himself. Now you got the, the stand-up comedian. He becomes another kind of an issue. And that's how comedy started in the fact that we had the first black white comedian that did stand-up was the great Leonard Reed because he looked like a white boy. And that's the Leonard Reed who did the Sim Sam. Exactly. The same Leonard Reed. Now, he opened for a show called Sweet and Hot, and he stepped out in what they called one and talked to the audience. No black entertainer had ever done that before. Now, Leonard Reed is the one guy who was able to take the situation because they thought he was white, but he was black. But nobody knew it because he looked like you. So, <laughs> race, listen, racism was in every part of show business. Every part of show business, you had racism. Not intentionally. It was because it was, if you look white, you can go certain places. And if you weren't white, you couldn't go certain places. Simple as that. How did, how did you, uh, do you remember how you felt when, so when the whiteies performed on their own terms, you had certain outfits. And then when you go and do movies like Day at the Races or Hell's a Poppin', they put you in oftentimes servant all outfits. And that, that you thought was a, you thought that was a presidential decision. We, they resented us looking like servants because you could not be dressed up. You had to be part of the, well, it was a, it was a stable scene. So you, uh, Frankie and them had overalls and Willa May and I and Anne, we had on May costumes because we fit the image of service. You could not be anything beyond that, I remember. Even Lena Horne had the same problem, and she was the biggest of all. And uh, she, with her, it was heartbreak. With us, we didn't give a damn. But Lena, it broke her heart that she was the best there was, but she wasn't good enough to be there. And that was a, a real tragedy, you know. Uh, the the show, Showboat came up. Now in Showboat, the girl who's the lead is a mixture, black and white, so it was, it was tailored perfect for Lena Horne. So she, they brought her in, they rehearsed her, they did this. So she thought, sure, for the first time in her life, she's going to have a role in a picture called Showboat. And they did all this preparation. Lena said she went through everything. I, I don't know how many auditions. Then they gave it to Ava Gardner. And that was such a tragedy because here was the one role that she could have, she didn't get. Ava Gardner got it. Now, uh, Ava Gardner wasn't her fault. They became good friends because of it. But nevertheless, it, it devastated Lena that she was not good enough to play in a show that was ready for her. She was the mixture, and she couldn't play the role. And there's a lot of things like that happened in show business. And it happened to when you become a star, you find out you can't go with it. The glass ceiling stops you. And uh, that's what happened with Lena. And it, uh, she was devastated about that. She, and she never had a role ever in any films. And that's why she quit and she left. There's nowhere to go. And, would, and she moved on beauty. Because the reason they had her come into the theater was because of her looks. But the talent wasn't there for them to accept her as a person. And they did not want the world to see a beautiful black girl standing up there in a beautiful gown. So when they, her pictures then came to the South, she was cut out of the movie at those times. That's what happened with the being started. We didn't give a damn. We were cut out all the time anyway, so we didn't give a damn. 
I mean, we had a different attitude. We were dancers. So we didn't have that feeling about being lost. But when you are a star by yourself, like Ella and Lena, they were women out there by themselves. And when they found themselves alone, they were alone completely, you know, completely. Ella completely was, uh, she was just a singer. The best singer that we ever produced. But Ella was lonely. So which consequently, you choose men as your partners, and boy, some of the men they pick, you say, who the hell, what, what you doing with this? Oh God, some of the men they pick, you say, listen, even I knew they was, they sucked. <laughs> <laughs> the loneliness did that to you, which was tragic. When you, uh, yeah. when you ran your own dance groups, yeah. uh, I assume you were still encountering some of that stuff. Do you have any memories of like, encountering either the racism or oh, the, the... Listen, when we follow race, I tell everybody, make sure you do not go in that door because they're going to kick your ass out. And they will. You have to be very frank with dancers because they would take you on. You can't just assume you can do something. You can't do it. So don't try it because you're going to put us all in jeopardy. See, when one person does something, they throw all your asses out. When Red, when Red messed up in Vegas at the time I was a sidekick for Red, I have got thrown out of more jobs because of Red, because he quit, and they, everybody with him get thrown out, and I'm one of those got thrown out. We were in Vegas, and he decided to take on, he was doing Santa the Sun, which is the greatest TV show. We have, we're top of the mark, we, we're stars. And here come Red discussing, fighting with, of course, the great Bud Yorkin. Now, Bud Yorkin is the man that signed your paychecks. Now you fight with the man who's signing your paycheck. Well, if Red messes up with the paycheck, I don't get a paycheck. And here I am again, thrown out because he quit Sanford. Now I don't have a job. And I'm sitting there, now where am I going? Every time when Red decided to walk away from something, we all suffered. See, when a star suffered, the whole crew suffered. And I was second in line. I got thrown out of more jobs messing with Red Fox. I wanted to shoot that son of a bitch. <laughs> Shit, I'm telling you, you couldn't believe it. Dude. So you had to you had to keep your own dancers oh, in that same idea oh, yeah. of like. Well, because young people get in all kinds of trouble for no rhyme or reason. Like we were down in Brazil, and sorry folks, but we were in Brazil where reefer is numerous. Anybody could have some reefer. So they found the <laughs> They found the gold mine of reefer. <laughs> and I said, oh, and where's the cops? Because you don't know. The kids go and mix with somebody. And I'm here in the hotel, don't know nothing. And all of a sudden, everybody's finding out you, something is going on. He's mixing with somebody that he met on the street. But when something happened to him, it happened to all of us. And uh, we almost, we had a, a reefer thing in Brazil. <laughs> What? I ain't going to jail for no damn reefer. <laughs> Dancers are dead. Well, young people get into, listen, young people get into trouble without knowing it. And it's easy in a foreign land to get into trouble. And when you get into trouble, you all are in trouble. So you come out, uh, you don't know whether to say something or keep quiet or let that son bitch string out there by himself. It's not an easy life to travel. I'm so glad I travel alone now because I don't have nobody to worry about now but me. <laughs> this might be a perfect segue. I had, I had a question okay. from uh, Lance Benishek. Oh my God, Lance Benishek. And he would love, he's asked you this question before in, in private, but he was hoping that it would be on record sometime. Yeah. And so he wanted me to ask you about uh, Swinging in the promised land and socks. Does that ring a bell? No. <laughs> swinging in the promised land. Well, What's the promised land? Uh, swinging the dream. Maybe swinging the dream? Swinging the dream. Swinging the dream and socks. Yeah. No, swinging the dream sucked, period. Okay. <laughs> it, was the biggest show, it was the biggest show that hit uh, uh, New York. Uh, every black star actor was in that show. It was, uh, that was a show starring Louis Armstrong and Benny Goodman. And uh, 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 we had every major star. The show was, we had 
uh, 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 Walt Disney did the scenery. Agnes DeMille was the choreographer. We had the biggest cast you ever saw. We were at City Center right across from Radio City. Exact same replica of Radio City was a smaller theater called City Center, and that's where our, that's where our show opened up. And it was heavy cast. It was everybody who was black who was a star was in that show. Maxine Sullivan, Bill Bailey, uh, I could, um, uh, I can't, it just everybody was in that show. Uh, Sonny Payne, who used to become the drummer with Count Basie. Uh, uh, we, we had Benny Goodman's group on this side. We had Bugsy Spaniard on this side. We had the 26 piece band in the pit, Don Boris. We, we had everything. You couldn't, uh, it was when you walk into the theater, did you ever see cats when you walk into the theater? The whole scenery is there for you? Well, that was the way our scene looked like. You were walking into a forest when you came in. And, and we were the, we, uh, the Lindy Hoppers was the creatures. We were the creatures in the forest. And uh, we had dancing girls. Uh, Butterfly, McQueen, uh, uh, Butterfly McQueen was Puck. Uh, uh, God, the cats were so big. But this show was so big that when we opened, the, the critic said, Shakespeare is confusing enough. But putting jazz into it ain't helping it worth it. <laughs> And I knew we were doomed from then on because it was confusing because you had two plays going on at the same time and they tried to put swing into it and that confused everything. So we died on the, we died a natural death swing. <laughs> and I thought this was gonna be our utopia. I'm 19, I'm becoming a star. Oh, I was the greatest. Honey, I found myself walking home and taking the subway. I didn't take the limo. <laughs> So uh, yeah, Lance had mentioned I think that yeah. you had almost gotten the uh, Lindy Hoppers had almost gotten thrown off that show or something. No, but that was that was Brazil when we we was down in Brazil, and uh, the Lindy Hoppers got into a fracas. Frankie and Billy Ricker got into a fracas with some people who was on the bus. So we all wound up in jail, all of us, in jail in Brazil. And Austin Wells used to look at us and said, "How would you like going back to Mini Giraffes? Because that's where we were." But we had gotten to a trouble because at the time America was uh, uh, initiating the new, what is it, the new policy. Uh, we had a policy about uh, uh, between South America and America. And uh, they said, this is how Americans act when they're out of the country. And they accused us of being traitors and all this kind of, and they were getting ready to kill us as we are getting ready to go to work. And this is what happened when that was in Brazil was not a very easy thing, because we used to say, please don't get us in an international situation. I asked was right in the midst of it. And I found myself sitting, you ever see a Brazilian jail? Dirt floors, dirt is hitting there. Oh my God, we're the greatest act in show business. <laughs> we were in a jail in Brazil. <laughs> Wasn't pleasant. <laughs> Question. Yeah, so talking about, I guess, racism, and um, I think our whole community is trying to be more inviting and encompassing towards everybody, right? Not just black people and white people, but all races. So I'm wondering if you can say a word or two as to maybe some advice on how to make that happen for both blacks listen, and whites and all that. Listen, you, you're living in a racist country. You're never gonna erase racism because as long as you got people coming in blocks, you're gonna have one person thinking they're better than the other. This is as natural, this is human. Fighting racism was a waste of time. America was built on racism. How are you gonna separate it? Anything black and white, there's gonna be a confrontation. I mean, except the fact that you're okay and I'm okay, but you're not gonna erase racism. You're gonna to have to erase America and start all over again. This is a racist country. Why? Because we're the only people that can't be assimilated. Every other people can come here Latins, black, white, if you're black, you look black. And if you're black, you're gonna separate them. And that's the reason for racism. How are you gonna change that? I've been black a long time, <laughs> honestly. And I'm not fighting it, I don't care. But you got starting black, you got a problem. And that was the problem. Remember, everybody came here. We was dragged here because we were walking too close to the river. <laughs> 
Do you feel, uh... Red Fox used to say, my name is Red Fox and I was born here. My father was Red Fox, he was born here. My grandfather was Red Fox and he was born here. My great grandfather's his ass was dragged here because he was walking too close to the river. <laughs> and take Red Fox when the fish is the issue always black men talking to white women. It always was an issue. The fight always why a black man couldn't talk to a white woman. So Red used to say, if you see him with a white woman, he's holding up for the police. <laughs> <laughs> Racist joke. <laughs> but that's how we took, right? It's always be a part. It doesn't matter who you are. When you walk into a door, if you're black, the first thing you're going to think, are they going to accept me? That's as natural. That causes every black person's mind from the time they enter a door. It's not intended, but it's in our DNA. We can't help it. The first thing, and any kind of action, and you get this. Race, it, it is so part of our everyday life that it doesn't, it, does it bother you? It, the, does what bother me? Sitting with a black person. No. There you go. See, but they got people, it bothers them. Remember just to sit next to a black person. So you, you, you can't erase that from that person. The best you can do is just ignore that so bitch and say, I don't care what you say. <laughs> you, you can't do anything about how people feel. People feel that they're better than someone else. Everybody can come to this country and can be afforded all the amenities of this country. A black person is not afforded that. I don't care what it is, they are not afforded that at any time. And uh, I don't care what it is, the first thing you think of, they're doing this because I'm black. And that's the attitude a black person had. And it's born in them. Uh, the first thing when a, when a woman has a, a boy, the first thing she tells him, she trains him how not to get killed when he walks out on the street. So how do you stop black kids from getting killed by white police? Is it racism? They kill every day, and it's still the same issue over and over again. The white policeman shot the unarmed kid, and that's always a part of you. So you don't want to think it's racism, but is it? Well, answer that question. <laughs> I know the first thing I think, uh-huh, I told you all. <laughs> Keep your ass out. Like me, I, I don't have a problem. I don't go out at night. That saved that problem. Because shit happened at night you can't believe. And why? Because that some bitch is out in a car, like one there's an issue where a guy is sitting in the car, smoking weed, and here come the police. So he gets killed. Now, is it because he was smoking the weed or because he was black? You always have a choice. And that's the issue about black and white people in America. I only can talk about America. But what's so funny, I live in Italy, and Italy now have Africans coming in to Italy. There's Somalians. So you see the Somalians and all the river, they're the guys that hustle the pocketbooks and things like that. And now you're gonna have, you have the same problem in Italy that we have in America. But now, is it because they're black? Or is it because they're hustling on the street and they're selling unwarranted kinds of things? And the issue now is in Italy. The, the same thing is England. Any place you go where there's black, where there's white, you're gonna have a contention of some kind. Who did it? Is it black or is it because the person did something wrong? So figure that out and you'd solve the problem of racism in America. We've solved it already tonight. We've solved everything is true. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we, we as dancers grow up hearing about the Savoy and usually the thing that's Usually the, it's a sentence, you know, the first integrated ballroom or, or like, you yeah. know, a major integrated ballroom. Right, and you couldn't go to the Roseland. Right. Right down the street. Now we're in the Savoy, we couldn't go to, now the Roseland people have come to the Savoy, we right. couldn't go to the Roseland. Now this is New York. We couldn't go, uh, Adam Clayton Powell had to open 125th Street for black girls to be able to go and sit at the cash register. 125th Street. You know what the, Cashwell, see, at a time when Woolworth and department stores had cash registers. 
and a girl who was at the cash register was white. Well, now they wanted to get black girls to be at the cash register. And Adam Clayton Powell had to march a whole lot of women on 125th Street to get a black girl to work at the cash register. This was, when was this? this I, Adam Clayton Powell. My mother was one of those women that walked up and down 125th Street. And there was a place called, uh, uh, we had right down the street, uh, we had Child's Restaurant on 125th Street and 7th Avenue. Now, it was a restaurant in Harlem. You couldn't go in there if you were black. So they had to move the restaurant from 125th Street and move it downtown. They had to move the Cotton Club from 142nd Street and Atlantic Avenue. They had to move it downtown. Why? Because at night, white people used to take over Harlem. And they wanted white people to have a change of spending money. And they wanted them to spend the money downtown. So they say, wait, to get them to spend the money to move the Cotton Club. So the Cotton Club was the first move out of Harlem, downtown. So white people would go to the Cotton Club downtown. It wouldn't be going to the Cotton Club in Harlem. And see, they had to move it because you couldn't, you segregated a person in a business in Harlem and a black person couldn't go in. Now, no black person could go into the Cotton Club. Now, was it racism or was it economics? There you go. Uh, so when we, when we hear about this idea of like the Savoy Bar integrated, yeah. I think, uh, especially if people don't know much about the history, it's, it's easy to think of it as like, oh, a, a dreamland where there is no racial problems or that kind there of stuff. There was racial problems on the dance floor. Yeah. We had a white boy named Harry, 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 Harry Rosenthal? Harry Rosenthal. He used to take on Frank. Frankie yeah. wanted to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Everything Frankie did, he could do better than Frankie. So that was right on the dance floor. That was not unusual. We got into fights because you were white, because I was black. We got into all kinds of fights, but it was good fights. We were just a better, we were a better dancer than you, all oh, that type of thing. And this went on the whole time in the ballroom. Uh, white kids come up to, to the ballroom to take us on. You coming into our ballroom. But see, the white kids felt it was their ballroom too. But we had Rose, we had uh, Harry Rosenberg, we had Jimmy Valentine. These was kids who could dance. And they dare you to tell them they couldn't dance as good as a black person, but you always had to fight. <laughs> but fighting was what we did best. <laughs> but by fighting, do you actually mean physical fighting? Oh, no, or do you no, mean no, like oh, on oh, the oh, dance floor oh, oh, you, or just like verbal? You out there, you out dance them. Jimmy, that, Jimmy Valentine had with one leg and a crutch. He could outswing anybody. <laughs> and, and anybody who knew Jimmy Valentine, you can't, sweetie, it, he was an Italian boy who could swing. Swing was something we did. Who was the better one? And we had great white dancers. We had great black dancers. And the fun was coming up against the contest. Harry Rosenberg was just the best because he took on, the, him and Frankie was always battling. Him and Frankie, because Frankie was the best dancer. Frankie was the best in the upper period in the ballroom. Nobody was better than Frankie. There were a lot of good ones, but nobody was better than Frankie. And he was as good as they come. Is that amazing? And we had white bands. Remember, Benny Goodman was a great white band, but he wasn't as good as Basie. Yeah. <laughs> Basie won. Now, that's not racism. You see, it, it's in everything you do, but it's not mean. It's not mean, it's beauty. Because when Benny Goodman comes to the Savoy Ballroom, how dare him dare to come to the Savoy Ballroom with a white band? But he did. He came to take on Chick Webb. You take on the king, you, and we hated him because he dared to come into the ballroom. But they swung like crazy. And in the end, the both bands swung it out together. You couldn't believe it, it was just a great night. And that was great show business. But the, the issue was always there, even at the slightest. If there was black and if there was white, what was it? Was it racism? And it's up to you to decide. Me, I don't give a damn whether it's racism, because racism never bothered me one way or the other. I'd walk in any door, period. And I still walk in any door. Sometimes I gotta be careful. I gotta sneak in. 
in Vegas, that's how we, we had to sneak in in Vegas. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr., the first time, Vegas was the top salary job there was. Now, it was always, you had the black side of town and you had the white side of town. Now, all of a sudden now, Frank Sinatra is coming to Vegas. Well, everybody knows Frank Sinatra is the goddamn king. He touched you, you were awarded everything in the world in Vegas. Now he's bringing Sammy Davis Jr. with him. And uh, they got, listen, the, when the Rat Pack came to Vegas, all doors opened for them. Everything, everything that was accorded anybody was accorded that. Now, there was never a problem as long as you had Frank and Dean Martin and Joey Bishop in them, but now you got a little black guy with him called Sammy Davis Jr. So they check into the hotel at the Sands and they refuse to accept Frank, I mean, accept Sammy at the hotel. And that was when Frank Sinatra hit the ceiling. That's when it hit the fan. He said, if he don't stay, none of us stay. And that was how the door opened for black people to entertain us who could come in and stay at a hotel. That was because of Sammy. We never stayed at a hotel in Las Vegas until Sammy had that door open because of Frank Sinatra. And Frank Sinatra said, ain't no way in the world you're gonna keep Sammy out. I mean, there wouldn't be no Rat Pack without Sammy. <laughs> Sammy showed them how to swing. Oh, did he show them how to swing? Good Lord. He taught Sinatra how to swing. Sinatra could sing, but he taught him how to swing. And nobody did that better than Sammy. Sammy hit a stage and you can just forget it. And that's what Frank Sinatra, they all love Sammy because of his talent. Uh, he, when that man hit a stage, God, you're looking at something, you couldn't believe the things he did on, it was simple. It was some things that we all did, but when Sammy did it, it did it better than anybody. Did you ever see that happen when you see a performer? You say, I, I can do that, but he does it better. And that was Sammy. And Frank Sinatra just worshipped him. Because Frank Sinatra used to look at him and say, and it was a talent that was not trained. It was ingrown. <laughs> Sammy became the greatest entertainer ever on the American stage. That was the male side. The female side of the greatest entertainer was Judy Garland. No woman ever did on stage what Judy Garland did. Not, you, can, you can't compare performances, because she was a woman that came up with performances. She had 25 years in, in, in films. She had 25 years of being trained. So when she got out on the stage at the palace, sweetie, you saw a performance you couldn't believe. This was that little girl called Judy Garland. And those were my two favorite. The two greatest performances I've ever seen on stage was Sammy Davis Judy and Judy Garland. I watched Judy Garland, I just was just, she did 33 songs at the, at the Palladium in London. But you know what 33 songs you sing 33? I sing three songs, they gotta give me water. And, and she did 33. <laughs> and then at the end they said, do Swanee, do Swanee. And, they, and that band hit them, da 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 da. And this broad started singing. I never heard of an eruption in a theater like I heard with Judy Garland when she finished. Uh, her, her stockings was falling down, her throat was, and she was shaking. <laughs> Boy, Judy Garland did something on stage. And this is the things that thrilled me. I saw performances that was just, you couldn't believe. And I've just never seen a woman perform like Judy Garland. I've never seen no entertainer like Judy Garland. And uh, when she did the palace, did any of you ever see Judy Garland? Only on the uh, no. You never saw her lot. She did a show at the Palace in, in New York where she sat on the stage and she just sat there and she talked to the audience. And she said she did a song called I Was Born in a Trunk. And she talked about her life in a song. Everybody in the theater, tears was coming down your eyes. She could drag that kind of performance out of you. She was like nothing you ever seen because she lived it. She lived all those years growing from 14 years old. She was, on, she was on stage 
And she gave us a performance that I've never seen anything like it in my life. She was so wonderful. I adored her. I just said, God, who had that kind of energy? Now, Mickey Rooney tried to keep up with her, but no one ever kept up with Judy Garland. And that was Judy Garland, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, and that was the succession of performances that I considered to be the best that I've ever seen. Who was your best? Who was your best performer? Paul McCartney puts on a very good show. <laughs> Paul McCartney, the Beatle, as saw Paul McCartney. I didn't get to see Frank Sinatra or... He's very good. Okay. All right. I think we have time for uh, one more question. Uh. One final question. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I know that uh, you referenced knowing Louis Armstrong, and I remember lots of talk about the past, about him being criticized by the black community and his approach to how to deal with the racism. Could you give us your personal thoughts on that? Well, they used to call uh, Pops a, uh, well, you see, to be entertaining when you were of, 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 of the image of Louis Armstrong, <sighs> you know, that was considered Tommy. And uh, it, it, a Pops answer to everything was, <sighs> I mean, it got him through the white line. It, it, you, you got to understand you have to win. And this was real black. And the, and the grin. Well, they consider that taming because you took the side of what white people expected you to, to be. A lot of people thought that he was a traitor because he began, he left the trumpet and began to sing. But Louis Armstrong was the greatest human being that I ever met as a performer. He was a person that would come in and make you feel comfortable. He was that kind of a person that made you enjoy to be, like you like to, he loved to smoke weed. And you enjoyed smoking a joint with him, you know what? <laughs> Me and Pops used to smoke it. They said, uh, hey, no, we fair, can smoke I it. Think... I, I can't go to jail, it's over. I've been there. <laughs> to be fair, I would assume, and this is an assumption, what? I would assume that most people in this room, if Louis Armstrong came and offered to smoke a joint with them, <laughs> It would be fools not to. Exactly. He was that great a guy. And you know, the, the greatest black man, I, the greatest black man that I ever knew in my life was the great Joe Lewis. Uh, Joe Lewis was just the greatest black man I ever met. I never met another human being like this. He was brilliant and he, had, he, he, he carried the black race on his shoulder. I mean, literally, he carried the black race on his shoulder. He came up at a time when at no time could you speak, say nothing. His job, he had one job, to become champion of, he had to become champion of the world. And he couldn't do that because there was a barrier. No black man was ever to be uh, heavyweight champion of the world, ever, at, after Jack Johnson. So here come a 21 year old, and they saw this young man who could possibly challenge that. And he was trained from the time he was 21 to be the champ. That meant he couldn't speak, he couldn't talk, he couldn't give interviews. So people got the idea that Joe was dumb. Me and him used to sit side by side like this and the jokes he would tell because we knew he was not dumb, but they know he dared not talk to a white woman. A man's career was lost if he was black and he talked to a white woman. So Joe Lewis did not speak. Like I said, Red Fox said, if you saw him with a white woman, he's holding up for the police. <laughs> and that made it different. Joe had to become champion. Now, when, 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 when the time come, Max, what's the great no, promoter? Max Schmeling. No. no, not Max Schmeling, the guy that did the promoter the fight. Uh, the, the promoter, Lou Jacobs, Jacobs, whatever. Anyway, he promoted the fight between Braddock and Joe Lewis because it was either Braddock and Joe Lewis or Braddock and Max. So if the German fought uh, uh, Braddock, they knew that they would take the champion out of America. So the deal was made for Joe Lewis to fight Braddock, but on one condition, the next 10 years of Joe's income 
a percentage of it would go to Braddock. And that was a deal he made so that Joe could fight, could have the fight, because Joe had to win. And that was how Joe Lewis won the championship, the heavyweight championship of the world. And that night, and all Joe could think of was because he had lost a fight to Max Schmeling. He said he's not, he, he's not considered a, a champion until he get that smelling guy again. And I remember Bing Crosby flew in from Hollywood to see the fight between Schmeling and Joe Lewis. And Bing Crosby said he sat down and the fight was over. <laughs> <laughs> and this was Bing Crosby. Joe killed him. Joe opened the door for every black athlete that came along afterwards. It was because of Joe Lewis that you had Muhammad Ali, you had Jackie Robinson, and, and there was a flood of black athletes that came in, but it was Joe that opened that door. And Joe had to take everything you threw at him because nothing came before the fact that he had to be champion. And I sat beside him when he became, he retired undefeated champion. And I'm sitting beside him, just like I'm sitting now, he's retiring. And the, all the, every place you saw, all the reporters and everything, Joe, what are you going to do now that you're retired, undefeated? And Joe said, they asked him if he's going to play golf, because he liked to play golf. So they said, are you going to play golf? So he turned to one of the guys, he said, what day do they allow us to play golf? Say, so they, they allow us to play golf on Wednesday. So he told to the reporters, I will be playing on Wednesday. And that was the door open for us with the great Joe Lewis my personal friend, the greatest man I've ever seen in my life because he made sure that when we needed something, he gave it to us. Whenever you needed anything, if you came with a business proposition, whatever it is, he backed you. That's why he didn't have no money. They thought, you see, anybody come with a dumb ass? You remember black people couldn't get a loan? You couldn't, uh, you couldn't move out of a certain area? You couldn't do nothing, you was in a box. And Joe tried to get all of us out of the box. I'd, I'd send word to, hey, listen, I need $75 to get my things out to clean us. The money would come through with something else, he would send it. He was that kind of a guy. He was just, he was my Joe. He was just great. I loved him. He was just, he carried black people a long time before you was able to go to the bank and get a loan. Because remember now, when you can't get a loan, what can you do? Now that's a loan. That's renting an apartment. All the simple, basic things that you needed, you could not get if you were black. That was the difference. And that's what Joe changed all of that. I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, we're out of time. OK, good. <laughs> but everyone, let's give a huge round of applause. Norma Miller. Incredible. Thank you so much for asking the hard question.